So, Paul and Warren, yeah, yeah, sorry. I guess you're going to put this room on fire. That's what you told me. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, we hi. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, everybody. So, we are here to speak about GNS, and GNS on fire is uh, the title of, of our talk, but more speci specifically about uh, GNS hijacking. So, my name is uh, Paul Raskanier. I'm a French guy, as you can hear. And, and uh, my name is Warren Mercer. I'm not a French guy, as you can hear. <laughs> um, so, as you can see, Paul and I work on a lot of very similar stuff. We're like work wife, work husband. I don't know who the wife or husband is, but one of us. You have the clicker, so you need to click now. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've definitely done this before. Um, so a quick agenda, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we're going to talk about DNS hijacking, specifically, uh, around two different cases. So one DNS manage and one sea turtle. Uh, so we're going to do a real quick, brief DNS introduction. We have uh, 57 slides, 58 slides in 30 minutes, so let's go. DNS protocol and DNS hijacking. So what is it? Uh, DNS protocol, we should all really know what that is, but if you don't, it's essentially how you translate google.com to its IP address and let you be really simple and type in google.com. So that, that's really easy. I'm going to skip through these because hopefully we're all good with this. If you're not, raise your hand and I will go over it. Sweet, we're all good. Um, so DNS redirection essentially works by altering the path that that DNS propagation traffic takes. So when I type in google.com, I should get 12345, but if I've got the ability to redirect, I might get 4321. Obviously, it's seamless to an end user because I don't see that because I see, ah, oh, Google.com, I'm very happy. That, uh, uh, so the chain of custody that comes with that, the points of sort of operation that you can attack this or interface with it, or interfere with it, sorry. Uh, you've got DNS administrators, DNS system interfaces, so like registrars, registrants, et cetera. DNS servers, if you use them locally, local name servers. Uh, network infrastructure, if you have a host address systems in place. DNS structures that you run locally within your own environment. And then the requesters endpoints. So we've got quite a, a lot of points in, in, in time where we can do this. So the attacks that we're going to go over are, are mostly focused on the high level side of it. So we're looking at registrars and registrants and stuff being attacked. Uh, redirection attacks are, are not rare. As you can see, there's no lack of threat actor capability throughout these. We've seen these all the way back to 2009. Um, from Iran right down to obviously 2016 where we see blockchain.info being compromised also. Uh, these have been sometimes for financial gain and just credential harvesting. What we're going to see is a bit more focused around government cyber espionage type attack. That was really quick, sorry. Like I said, lots of slides. Yeah. So uh, how did we start? So I'm not really a network guy. I'm more into malware analysis uh, initially. So as a previous talk, everything starts by malware and spear phishing uh, in this case. And, and I started to work on this case because uh, a guy, a bad guy, uh, created some hr-wipro.com domain or hr-suncore.com domain. And these two domain, wipro.com and suncore.com, are real uh, HR-related company. And we discovered that someone is using LinkedIn to, to propose a job to a couple of people by adding this link and saying, yeah, please fill this form for, for the new job you are, you are looking for. It's a malicious document. And the attackers use, in fact, a real one. This Suncor uh, document, you can get it on the Suncor website. And the guy had malicious macro inside of the document in order to deploy malware on, on the system. The malware support HTTP and DNS, which is not something uh, really weird. It's not, DNS a little bit more uh, less often, but it's, it's not something new. And we decided to, to work on it, check how it works exactly, the, the feature. And the malware is really simple. And specifically in this case, the first sample I found, the guy forget to remove the debug. So he generated a log.txt with everything here. And he's able to download stuff, upload stuff, execute command, really classical uh, thing. If I look at the HTTP mode, uh, the attackers create a fake uh, Wikipedia page, and the malware connect on this page, look at the source code, and you have some base64 uh, command encoded. And once you decode it, you have a reconnaissance phase. Uh, it simply gets information about username, host name, and, and the domain name on, uh, of the system. Yeah, it's my debug for provided by the developers. So I've got this log file. It's very convenient to understand how it works. 
And we have a DNS uh, capability. So in this case, how the malware communicates in DNS, it's really easy. He performed DNS query with an, a unique ID that say, hello, I'm this machine. And the commands are sent by the IP. For example, here you've got 100.105.114.0, and it's DIR, and zero for, for end of line. So that's how the malware receives the command to execute on the system. And the answer, the output of the command, was sent by DNS. Same thing, it's cut on subpart and everything is sent through DNS. So it's really, really noisy from a DNS point of view. Uh, on your infrastructure, it's really easy to trick that you have a huge activity of uh, random string dot domain dot com. But yeah. Oh. Some statistics, so we observed uh, DNS resolution mainly in Middle East. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm here to speak about DNS hijacking. So what's the point? Okay, you have a malware using DNS, but it's not really DNS hijacking. But we started to look at different uh, C2 server used by the DNS espionage, And we discovered that one of these specific IP had a lot of different .gov uh, domain that point to this IP from different country uh, in Middle East. So we have someone that are able to modify DNS of a couple of .gov something in Middle East to point to one of these specific IP. A few hours uh, before, a few minutes before, sorry, we can see uh, that a Let's Encrypt certificate was generated for this specific domain. So it's clearly DNS redirection. Someone is redirecting a legitimate uh, .gov something domain, mainly VPN server, mail server, and I th it's more or less VPN and mail. During a few minutes, and create a Let's Encrypt certificate to have a valid and trusted uh, SSL encryption for, for, for the man in the middle. Yeah, it's basically what I explained with a, a beautiful camera. So if we take the end of uh, last year, we saw uh, a couple of redirection uh, in September, October, November, different domain, different country, except one domain, which was a kind of private company, the other one is only a uh, public sector. If you look at the schema, you, have, uh, you can see the Let's Encrypt certificate was generated before the redirection, but it's incorrect. To create the certificate, you need to do the redirection before, but the time is due to our uh, passive DNS uh, delay. We don't have the stuff in real time. We lost a few minutes uh, of, of DNS uh, replication. And if we look deeper on time, we saw that the same actor started to play this game in the beginning of 2017, but he didn't do it a lot, and with time, he started to do it more and more and more. So it's not something new for, for this uh, specific actor. So finally, uh, we have more than 25 redirections since the beginning of 2017. Two years of activity, a huge peak at the end of last year when we discovered uh, this, this guy. We identify more than 10 countries impacted by redirection. Uh, public and private sector, I would say, 95% public and 5% private sector. Mainly in, in Middle East and few cases in Europe and US, but it's, uh, I think it's a secondary target. So the purpose was not really to do something in US or Europe, but uh, they needed something from this country, but at the end it was uh, linked to Middle East. <clears throat> and then along came an oil rig. Um, so there's an oil rig leak. March last year, or March this year, sorry, uh, March, April time. So good thing about leaks are we can all look at them. So Paul and I were able to go in and actually look at the, the oil rig leaks that come out and look at the infrastructure that had been leaked and look at the tools and, and codes and screenshots and everything else that could be leaked. The interesting thing here is we find no evidence of DNS espionage as a panel in terms of what was leaked from a code point of view. And then we also discovered Kharkov um, later on after DNS espionage. And again, we observed no actual overlap or code or anything that linked directly to it. But what we did see was this. Um, this is a panel called Scarecrow. And I don't think that laser works. No, it does not. If you look at the country, you see that every one of those is Lebanon, bar one that's France. Uh, we know who the French person was, but it's, it's not a company or anything. It's a researcher. Um, Lebanon is obviously highly 
targeted in terms of what this actor is looking at and the, the countries it's looking at, the regions it's looking at. So it, when we start to tell our victimology and we start to obviously see some of the redacted information that we can't show, we start to determine, okay, this actually is a DNA assessment on a stroke Kharkov panel. So Paul is really weird, and Paul remember, remembered this string. Now, you can't see it very well, but it's basically this was panel um, with a few, obviously, character substitutions. So that's cool. I thought, right, Paul, what does that mean? Paul's like, oh, there was a report. I'm like, what? How did you remember that? So Paul remembered this panel name convention that was in Last Line's report um, not too long after we released the DNS and stuff. So they had identified um, from memory, oh, it's actually it says there, so not even from memory, a C2 misconfiguration within their Django instance that was used uh, as obviously a C2 for DNS and They were able to then get access to this and they seen the panel path. So you can obviously see if I go back, the similarities in the panel path. So obviously that's not a massively great way to link something when you're just looking at character substitution, but for us, given that it was the exact same C2 panel that we linked back to the malware, it was a slight variation in the character substitution, we're happy enough, I think, to say that this was the panel that was used for DNS espionage and then obviously also for Kharkov. Um, obviously, this is all free for you guys to look at as well. As we say, it's, it's obviously worth highlighting that we can all go and look at this and we're more than happy to talk to anyone if you want to discuss this more. Um, so what else was in that oil rig league? So this framework called WebMask, and because we don't have enough time, we can't go over these individually, but essentially we have WebMask, which we then can link back in a way, I'm using my words very carefully here, in a way to DNS manage. Um, essentially we have a framework that performs man in the middle DNS redirection, exactly what DNS espionage was used for, and exactly what Kharkov used for. We have ICAP for proxy pass through, we've got squib proxy usage, this is all Python scripts that are within uh, the, the oil rig league. And then the use of cert bot, again, it can be used to create let's stick with bots automatically like that. So all this starts to link up. Uh, we can't 100% say that WebMask was used for DNS espionage, but it's very, very technically possible. Uh, maybe, we'll go with. So um, obviously the guy this morning was talking about confidence levels that you associate with this. We would say we're moderately confident that it is, however we can't be almost certain, I think was his right wording. So that was DNS espionage, um, good fun, uh, and employed a lot of Paul and I's time. And then we started working on another one called Sea Turtle. Um, aptly named Sea Turtle because one of the guys working on it with us at the time was watching a National Geographic program about sea turtles. Yeah, so, so, so it's not a hidden message for attribution. Yeah, no, it was not to do with attribution at all. Um, so what did Sea Turtle do? Well, it had a clear primary motive. Comparatively speaking, when you look at DNS espionage, it, it hits certain targets and certain entities. Um, with Sea Turtle, it hit very similar, but their main primary objective was espionage. These guys don't want money. They want design documents. They want documents that are a bit more akin to what people want with their trying to maybe build their own infrastructure or create their own products or services that they don't have within those countries. Um, their clear primary targets and victims were Middle Eastern again. Um, so mostly focused around intelligence agencies, military, and as Paul mentioned, very, very heavily focused on public sector as opposed to private sector. Uh, little oil and gas as always operates in that region anyway. Um, sea Turtle were, we believe, very heavily to be a state-sponsored attack, and they're the first publicly confirmed case of a DNS registry compromise. It was NetNode in Sweden. So NetNode released a post in January 2019, if I remember rightly, and that post essentially said we've been hit by a wave of DNS redirection and targeted DNS attacks. We were able to work that back and determine that this we link to Sea Turtle. Um, so what does victimology look like? So as of July 2019, uh, this has changed slightly. Uh, you'll see we've got a primary, a secondary, and then some new Sea Turtle victims. So we reported this March 2019, roughly, and we then found some identified new targets. So Switzerland, uh, Albania, no, sorry, Switzerland, Greece, and Sudan is where we identified new targets. Again. Not private sector, but public sector, government ent entities, intelligence agencies. Uh, there was an airport up in there as well, um, in one of those countries too. So Sea Turtle was very, very cute as to how they targeted. As you see, we have a primary and a secondary target function. Um, what we're trying to do here is try and underline the fact that the secondary targeting and the primary targeting were not directly related, but they allowed Sea Turtle to carry out its next wave of attack or its next wave of compromise. Um, very quickly, register, registry, register, because we have this conversation all the time. Um, C Turtle attacked both the registrar and the registry. So really quickly, the registry is a platform like VeriSign, which you can buy your .com domain from. They manage the TLD. Uh, the registrar is an organization who can then sell that on, so GoDaddy, for example, and then you've got a registrant, which is anyone in the room who buys a .com address. So the flow of that would be, I go to GoDaddy, buy a domain name, 
that domain name is owned by a, a root server or a, a, sorry, a registry organization who owns the ownership of that TLD, real quickly. Um, so what did Turtle do from a methodology point of view? Gain initial access to an entity, so this was one of the platforms that they wanted to target first. So as I mentioned, we have a primary and a secondary targeting system here. Primary target was potentially a register, potentially a registrar, depending on what way you want to look at it, which then allowed them to obtain credentials and then further on carry out their attack and essentially laterally move exfiltrate stuff off their infrastructure. Um, what CTOR was very interested in was obviously DNS registry via compromised credentials. So this was breaking in and having DNS redirection and DNS hijacking within an infrastructure. Uh, they used an update command to then change the name server used, which meant that your name server was no longer in use. It was now one of the actor stroke illicitly controlled platforms. Um, pretty picture uh, element of that is initially compromised, move through your network infrastructure, gain credentials, uh, very heavily use of pub publicly uh, available exploits. So this group didn't need zero days to carry out a lot of this attack. Uh, we're not saying they don't have access to zero days, but they didn't need access to zero days to carry out some of this infrastructure attacks. People run old systems, we all knew this, uh, please patch, please patch, uh, it will help a lot of us in the room. So they were able to use these publicly listed exploits that we'll discuss in a moment. They then able to access registry C panels, change information related to name servers, change information related to A records, and then thus you have the cycle of DNS hijacking kicked into play. So what do we see? We see a victim sent a DNS request for targeted domain. Obviously the actor now controlled the, re the, re the replying domain service. So the, they were then sent to falsified A record, which was a, a web front end created by the actor. Again, very much linked to VPN and email credential harvesting. Uh, victim entered their information into a man and middle server that was controlled by the actor. Actor then started to sniff all the credentials and they, they were passed on and were able to authenticate as the victim. Again, the pretty picture element of that. Malicious name server is compromised. You have the IP address that's sent from a victim to a DNS server. I then have a, an X509 certificate replacing the infrastructure that I'm obviously mimicking to have the, the little green padlock that everybody in here loves so much. And the victim then notices nothing different, types in their information and goes on to the website. Uh, the actor in some instances did authenticate to the website and was able to redirect the user to a, a successfully verified session. Um, so yeah, what's up with CTURL? Um, very, very heavily motivated actor. As I mentioned, these guys don't want your, your money or your social security number or anything like that. These guys want your rocket designs, your intelligence information reports. They want really high level stuff that should not be available to any individual, not within that environment. Um, normally, oops, sorry. Uh, normally what we find is a cool off period. So again, everyone in the room who publishes anything, normally when you push something out about an actor, they stop and they're like, okay, we've been discovered. We're gonna chill out for a while. These guys did not. They, they have, they literally just don't care. They're among the most brazen and aggressive actors that we've probably tracked within Talos. Um, they attacked multiple registrars, multiple regions. Uh, they have a, a clear path around DNS manipulation attacks. The big issue with that is if they do it wrong, they can bring down the internet because depending on who they attack or who they compromise from a registrar point of view, they could do something very incorrectly and bring down perhaps a TLD for the world. So it's something that we've tried to get across in, in both our blogs and the talks that we've given on this. This isn't an actor who we believe are just after, as I mentioned, financial information, but th they have the capability and path to be able to do anything they want within the DNS system. Now, what's very important to note is we did not observe or witness any TLD root servers compromised. So out of the root servers that are out there, we know of none of those that were compromised. However, we showed multiple registrars that were, which have access to the TLD domains, which actor could have potentially controlled, CCTLDs and GTLDs. So that access to a lot of different content. Again, if they mess up the name server redirection or they mess up a, a, a name re redirection, they have a, the potential path there to really break the internet for everyone, which I wouldn't like. Uh, they did certificate abuse, as I mentioned. So in some instances, because they had access to the infrastructure, they were able to steal both the public and private key. Now, a lot of people ask, what's the point in stealing the public key? Well, I can put that public key up and you can read it and you can see that that's the correct public key. But if I'm an attacker, that's really no good because I can't read that traffic unless I have the private key. So again, we're asked that a lot. The point here is they had access and the capability and the ability to steal private keys. I'm not telling you exactly what to think, but if you put two and two together, you could work something out. Um, initial compromise that came with it then. Uh, further thefts, so stealing of legitimate certificates to reuse in their own infrastructure. 
So this is normally what happens, as I say, you disrupt it and they go away and everything's all good. But no, July 2019, they came back. Well, not came back, they started changing up their game. They, they unfortunately never went away. Uh, what we've seen here was compromise of various entities, but this time they only had a single name server for a single victim. So if I compromised Paul, I had one name server related to Paul. If they then compromised me, they had one name server related to me. So they started doing a one-to-one -one mapping. There was no more one-to-many mapping. So Intersect DNS from memory was one of the, the name servers that was used on a couple of different victims that were attacked here. In this latest instance, it was a one-to-one -one mapping. So we were only able to identify a small amount of uh, victims here. Uh, multiple observed cases, as I mentioned, all live for less than 24 hours. Get in, get the information, get the credentials, harvest what you need, and get out. So. It's interesting from a couple of different instances. They're obviously capable enough to be able to get in and out quickly to get the information they wanted. It also meant then there was a very limited time for tracking, a very limited time for monitoring. So if you are monitoring your DNS infrastructure, I don't know how long it takes you to look at those logs or how long it takes you to get through those logs during a day, but you may not access them every single day. So that gives SeaTurtle the capability to get in and out and basically run away. Uh, again, July, they were very focused in the Middle East and North Africa. So they swim on, unfortunately. Uh, they really didn't care that we outed them, we disrupted their operations, we shut down their C2 infrastructure, we got all their certificates redacted, I mean, sorry, retracted. We did everything that we possibly could as an organization and as a research individual. They don't care, they keep going. Um, again, state-sponsored, very heavily capable, uh, very highly motivated. I think the motivation part comes across here when you see that they don't care. Whenever you out them or disrupt any of their operations, they just literally keep going. They have no interest. Uh, protection. Yeah, and if you want a fun story about that, they so don't care that, for example, we know that they are reading our blog post with the IP of the proxy used uh, for the DNS hijacking. <laughs> so I didn't think we could say that, but that's cool. Yeah, if, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so they even troll us uh, with that. Anyway, so protection. Uh, after the first publication concerning uh, DNS espionage, uh, Homeland Security published an emergency directive about uh, how to mitigate DNS infrastructure tampering. So uh, it, it's not rocket science. It's simply stuff you must do for every context. First thing, monitoring. So normally, a lot of companies monitor the D DNS of outside, but don't really monitor their own DNS, their own infrastructures. So check your DNS infrastructure and, and try to use external DNS resolver, because if you use your compromised DNS to check your DNS, maybe you will have some issue. Uh, Two-factor authentication. It's, it's not uh, bulletproof, but it's uh, another uh, step for the attackers, another new stuff to deal with. Uh, and patching, as uh, he explained, uh, this uh, C-Turtle used well-known vulnerability uh, on the campaign. Uh, they, at our knowledge, they didn't use uh, zero day. And I think it's uh, more or less all the recommendation from, from DHS. So conclusion? I mean, this is very real. These guys are more than happy to attack core infrastructure and try and get the information they need. Uh, there's not really anything any of us in this room can do. As I mentioned, they're highly capable, they're highly motivated. We just need to get better at monitoring. Um, as Paul mentioned there at the end, try and look at your DNS. It's such a key like, goldmine within your infrastructure. Uh, everybody's very focused on what's coming into their target and what's coming into their victims, but they never look at internally what's going on. Um, DNS espionage and Sea Turtle made that, uh, I think for us anyway, a, a very eye-opening piece of information. It was like, these guys were able to manipulate it with inside and then get out. So I, I think if you pay a bit more attention to your DNS, you see things a lot more clearly. Um, I think another thing that was really interesting with this was the primary and secondary targeting side of things. If you, uh, if you read the blogs that we put out in this and you see the maps and the victims that were attacked, um, you'll see you can start to piece together pieces of information. We can't talk about it, but if you look at some of the maps and some of the pieces of infrastructure, you can see why you have a primary and a secondary targeting platform. So what we mean by that is I may attack one person, but have no interest in them as a capability or no interest in them as an operation, but they give me access to the next person. So if you look at some of the maps we put out, uh, you can see very um, strategically aligned and keyly placed victims that then link to other sections of the, of the world. Uh, but yeah, that's really it from me from a conclusion point of view. Uh, pay attention to your DNS. It's so important and it's such a, a cool swath and such, such a cool goldmine to look at. Do you have anything to 
Yeah. No, so questions if anyone wants. Two minutes. Uh, we won't comment on attribution because everyone asks who done it, and so we won't comment that, so don't ask it.